Good afternoon and welcome to the Aberdeenshire Community Development Webinar, Hints, Tips and Funding. And what a lineup we've got you for you today to offer exactly that. It's fantastic to see such a large turnout, not only from Aberdeenshire, but in fact from all over the country. I think this um, showcases the level of interest for community led projects and showcases the number of volunteers we have working and delivering projects for their communities. My name is Audrey Mahi, the Strategic Town Centre Executive for Aberdeenshire, and I'm going to hand over to our Chair of the Infrastructure Committee, Councillor Gail, in a few minutes. Before I do that, I'd like to just run through a few housekeeping rules um, for this afternoon. If everyone could please um, put themselves on mute and, and keep muted throughout the event today, just to block out any background noise um, for our speakers. If we could try and keep the chat clear to allow for any questions for any of our speakers today. And if you add any of your questions at any point of the event into the chat, um, we will run the Q&A um, once the last speaker has presented. Um, we're going to do our very best to stick to the time allocated. So we hope to be finished for, for four o'clock today. And we're going to do our best to spotlight the speakers as they present. So if you'd like to, to switch on your, your, your speaker mode or your small gallery mode, um, you'll be able to get a clearer view. We're going to record the event today and circulate the recording along with a Q&A sheet and any questions that we don't manage to answer directly today, we will add them to that or we'll get back to you individually after the event. We've got a tremendous lineup for you today with information on future funding. We're going to highlight two exemplar projects fr from within the Aberdeenshire Town Centre Toolkit. And our speakers are going to present some tips, some advice on how to take that idea you have through the stages of feasibility, consultation to a shuffled ready project, looking for funding and how to take the project through to delivery. Um, I'd now like to hand over and introduce Councillor Gail, who will be our host for today and who will say a few words and introduce our first speaker. Councillor Gail, over to you. There we go. I was pressing on the microphone button and nothing was happening, which is always a depressing stage to be in when you're about to host such a fantastic gathering. Uh, welcome everybody. It is absolutely fantastic to see so many people have joined this um, uh, webinar. I have to get used to the language. This webinar today. Um, so before I start, can I just on behalf of you all offer a huge thanks to Audrey and her brilliant team for pulling all this together today, spreading the word far and wide. So we've got people literally from all over the place. There's some many of you I know or have met. Um, a lot of you I haven't, but you're all exceptionally welcome. Um, and it's really good to see you all here this afternoon for what I hope will be an interesting session. Um, because we do have in Aberdeenshire some community based community run projects that are absolutely brilliant. There's no two ways about it. Um, and the purpose of today is really to to talk about those sort of projects, to talk about how projects can be developed um, and to um, present the town centre toolkit that our colleagues in economic development have been developing along with community groups and so on. And, and that's what it's all about. It's about sharing that experience that we've we've developed in Aberdeenshire um, and making that available for a wider audience, be that um, through the rest of Scotland, through the rest of the UK or uh, other communities within Aberdeenshire who are just at the start of the process of, of developing um, community projects. Um, it can be exceptionally challenging. I have in, in this life as a, as a councillor for the last 20 years or slightly over. Um, been involved in a whole range of projects and before that through community economic development in my um, home, home village of Aboyne, um, been much involved in all of these things and I know how complicated and challenging it can be trying to get funding together, getting people together and all of that. So if we can share the experience of people who have done it and done it so brilliantly well, um, then, then the support for everybody. And as I say, the Aberdeenshire Town Centre Toolkit is there to help as well. So that's the purpose of this afternoon, um, but you haven't come to listen to me. I know that. Um, so I will, without further delay, hand over to our first speaker. Um, and that is uh, Phil Prentice. 
Well, I think probably the last time I saw you, Phil, was in the musical in Aberdeen. Um, I rather suspect for the, the town centre uh, conference a little while ago. Um, Phil is the, the chief officer of Scotland's Towns Partnership and programme director of Scotland's Improvement Districts. Uh, he considers it his core. Sorry, he consider, considers it core to his role uh, to ensure a collaborative community is built to support and promote the development of Scotland's towns. Prior to his appointment to SDP in November 2014, Phil headed up economic development, regeneration and employability services within East Renfrewshire Council. He's also worked as a senior executive for Scottish Enterprise and in the private sector. A graduate of the Universities of Ulster, West of Scotland and Glasgow, Phil is now focused on helping city districts, towns and smaller settlements across the country. And he's here today to ensure we're all ready for a new future for Scotland's towns. So Phil, um, over to you. Thanks very much for coming. Thanks Chair and uh, good afternoon everybody. Uh, six years ago when we first launched the uh, Town Centre Action Plan, we done a series of roadshows and the first place we went to was the Aberdeenshire. Uh, last week, as the councillor has just pointed out, we have updated Scotland's policy on towns with a new future for Scotland's towns and I think it's quite fitting that Aberdeen shares the first local authority to host one of these post review events. I think it's validation for the team in the council, Audrey in particular and her team, that such a, an amount of effort and energy is put into the towns and I have to say they are some great towns whenever the Covid restrictions relaxed a wee bit it was actually the first place we headed to this summer. So we got a couple of days up in Cullen and we got into the Shire to look at some of the towns, the coast. It was absolutely beautiful. So it's great to be amongst you today. Uh, my brief is really just to talk about where is the money coming from and how do you position yourselves to be aware of all of that? It's been a really a difficult year, no doubt, for our town and city centres, but I think that's shone a light on just how important they are. Town centre is the heart of your community and there hasn't been enough nurture and care given to those town centres over the last 30, 40 years. Hopefully we've reached a turning point where a return to localism, less commuted, commuting, blended learning, net zero, all these opportunities to repopulate, etc., to build on tourism. It's a point in time where the Shire can actually lift again because it has some great towns and a great local authority with uh, all of the focus that's needed to, to drive long term improvement. Whenever the pandemic hit in March last year, the first thing we did was to try and get money out to people. Uh, to explain STP's role, we basically, we are a contractor working on behalf of Scottish Government, so we're a very, very small team, basically acting as a throughput to try and get resources out to you guys at local authority level and even down beneath that to individual town level. So we're a free service, uh, we work right across the country and we're also working and engaging very closely with the devolved nations. I sit as a director in the UK task force and once I've finished here today I'm going to jump into the Northern Ireland Assembly. Everybody's talking about towns so it's really important that you know Aberdeenshire who have been our leading local authority, I have to say the work of Audrey and the guys around embedding the town centre first principle thinking about the place principle and now launching the town toolkit means that these guys are always a step ahead, always aware of what's coming and Audrey's on to me once a week saying right Phil keep me right what's coming so it can be in the right place to grab some of this new money. So a great team that's a good starting point. We issued some bids resilience funding uh, earlier in the year so you know the likes of Inverurie and Peterhead would have benefited from that. That was really just to understand that whilst big government has good intentions and local government have good intentions, it's often very difficult to translate that right down to the hyper local level. And that's where we've seen the value in community groups, development trusts, business improvement districts, because they are the ones with the knowledge on the ground about what needs to be done, who needs to be helped, who are the people who can help most. So we try to get that money out as quickly as possible. That happened in April, May. In June, July, we moved into the Towns and Bids Resilience and Recovery Fund. And that was recognising that not all towns had a bid. So we tried to get as much money out across the country. Over 180 towns were supported across Scotland in that phase. That was followed up by the Scotland Loves Local campaign. And that was a campaign about 
trying to consolidate some of these better behaviours that people had had, had come to um, to actually engage with. So more active travel, better support for vulnerable within our communities, actually just rolling up your sleeves and helping out and starting to engage more with your local green space, your heritage, your local high street. Thinking twice about you know jumping onto online platforms and ordering things off Amazon, when in reality, if you've been investing that in your local shops and your local economy, that money stays a lot longer on an average flips five or six times. So you're actually keeping your neighbor's son or daughter in a job. It's the right thing to do. Plus, it actually contributes to net zero. So the Love Local campaign, which will launch again as we reopen, and it's this time it's an irreversible reopening, we will reopen again into April, May, and we will launch the Love Local campaign again on STV borders to basically reinforce all of those positive messages about localism, about community wealth, about supporting your local enterprise, your local economy. Because at the end of the day, those little businesses and service uh, businesses across your economy, that's the lifeblood. That's the lifeblood of what you are. It's the lifeblood of all the stuff that you need. So just really start to um, embrace that. Uh, the government, again, I think, probably mainly because of UK consequentials, were able to prioritise towns even further. So there was an additional 18, month, 18 million pounds given out to the local government sector in the autumn towards the town centre boost, which was to fund capital projects. And there was an additional 12 million again given to local authorities to focus on regeneration capital grant programmes. So there's been quite a lot of investment this year, but the good news is there is going to be much, much more. This year we'll see the biggest jump in funding for the town and city centre agenda that, that, that has happened over the last decade or so. There's going to be a lot of money targeted towards place-based investment. And I think that's the key word here. Don't just think of a high street or a bid or a town centre. Think of the place holistically. What are the key assets? What are the key challenges? What are the opportunities? Who are the key anchor organisations? Not just always the local authority, but the business groups, the community groups, the, the citizens that are on the ground as well, and the other stakeholder organisations that could be playing a bigger role. So take a much more holistic place-based approach. The Scottish Government's place-based investment programme is going to look towards collaboratives. It really wants to see where you have public, private and third sectors working collegiately. Uh, the reason for that is not, not one sector is going to be able to emerge from COVID crisis on its own. Every sector is going to be challenged and damaged. And it's only when you pull the heft of everybody working together and playing to their strengths that you'll see real progress. So we want to encourage much more of that. The place-based investment programme details will come from the Cabinet Secretary in due course, but that will become available in the next financial year. So from April, April onwards. Again, it hasn't been made public, but I can announce quietly that there will be a further round of funding for our business improvement districts coming shortly. So a, an additional revenue stream. And again, because Audrey and the team are so proactive, you know, they'll know about that and have everybody primed and ready to go. So there will be more resources given uh, in Verary, Peterhead, etc. But right across the country, we'll be supporting somewhere in the region, I think, of 45 bid projects. Um, and there's a big demand, believe it or not, people are starting to understand that a more community focused uh, improvement district approach is the way to go. So we have potential for seed corning, grant supporting in, in lemon's terms, probably up to another 10 or 12 improvement district projects next year. So there's a real strong appetite across the country, maybe even driven by the pandemic and some of the issues that that's created to get people talking in the same room to say, look, we are not letting our town centre fall any further. We're going to get to work together and start to think about solutions. And that could be anything from teenage markets to bring people into the high street. Again, in the early stages when people are still a bit reticent about coming in in big numbers, that's outdoor, it's safe, it can be spaced out. Again, more outdoor cultural events and festivals, thinking about the health and well-being, thinking about taking some of the redundant retail space and creating pop-up shops, again, for social enterprise, uh, for local crafters, for young people, et cetera, et cetera. So there's lots of activity going to be coming. The, there will be another round of Scotland Loves Local. So again, moving through the recovery phase, we will be trying to get revenue out to the towns that don't have business improvement districts. Uh, in a couple of weeks time, we will be making another announcement about a town and city gift card. So we'll be creating a national platform where local towns can actually just put their face onto that. So for example, smaller towns like I don't know, like Buchan, 
that wouldn't not necessarily have enough money to design one of these things themselves. Central government through STP are going to take on the development costs, the first year setup costs, and basically create a white label where you can put uh, the face of BAM from the front of that and then sign up all the local retailers. That card can be used more generically for people to gift to family, friends, relatives, but even more strategically where corporates can actually, uh, instead of giving them an, an Amazon card, could give them a Buckin card or could give them a Cullen card, and that can only be redeemed in physical businesses within those locations. It cannot be used online. It retains the money. It's a closed loop system. So look out for that coming over the, um, the coming couple of weeks. Uh, and over the summer period, we'll be onboarding as many businesses across the country as possible. Uh, so again, it's just trying to be able to give the small independent niche service retail, retail, people within town centres another means of actually um, delivering um, their services or their goods safely. So that, that and uh, the other thing is the government has recognised that town centre projects, the last couple of rounds of capital funding that have gone to local government, whilst they've been well received, there probably hasn't been enough lead in notice. And then that puts the local authority guys in the back foot in terms of being able to deliver. And especially with COVID where you've been having difficulties securing contractors, there's been disruption. So what we're now looking to do is a rolling capital fund with COSLA. And I think that paper's already gone to COSLA to be signed off, which means that you can take a longer term view. You can maybe think about bigger projects and spread them over two or three years because you'll know that there's going to be a five year program of funding through program for government. I have to say, I mean, I'm not a political person because town centre should not be political. It's the one space where every member of society, colour, class, creed, everybody is welcome in our town and city centres. It's not safe, neutral meeting space for people. But the government has been very ambitious around this programme. And the amount of investment through place-based investment programmes, 275 million, that's just a starting point. But also thinking about the future, about net zero and active travel, there's almost 500 million in the active travel budget. And if we start to break through the silos and join up community, housing, digital, energy, culture, town centres, all of a sudden you should be able to come up with much better place-based holistic plans that are easier to attract investment. So it's been ambitious, but taking a place-based approach. I have got five minutes before I head off to see Arlene and Michelle. So if anybody wants to ask questions far ahead, otherwise I'll just hand back to the chair and disappear and Audrey can send me whatever questions you've got later. Okay, that's that's great, Phil. Thanks very much. And uh, just to pick up on one point um, that you made around the, the very, very tight deadlines for some of the capital funding that's come uh, for community-based projects. Uh, it is not the best way to do it. And if that's recognised, then communities have time to develop projects and to and to take them forward in a, in a sensible way. That would be a huge improvement. But rushing to get everything committed by the end of this financial financial year when it's announced in November is you know, frankly nonsense. So um, the, the more that we can do to persuade government governments um, to, to be more flexible in their approach, the better. Uh, but there's a question there. I, I don't know if you can see the chat bar there, Phil. There's a question there from Dawn. So do you want to, if you can see it, can you pick it up? If you can't see it, I will read it to you. How can we support more rural settlements, joining maybe some, some of these together to make a bigger focus? Yeah, uh, the, Scottish, the Scottish government do have a, a strong focus on rural, particularly in terms of heritage, tourism, the fact that we can have renewables. They maybe haven't had a stronger voice. You know, usually the bigger guys, the city guys, have you know, been shouting louder. Now that we've actually returned to a different form of the new economy, so as we move through the pandemic, we will not see lots of people living in small commuter villages, traveling to cities. Much more of the population will actually be home-based, which gives massive opportunity. Digital infrastructure is required in terms of building in the resilience to allow that remote working and blended working, but also to encourage young people to stay and to, to make sure that it's not seen as a second choice that they're staying in those smaller communities. Probably the best visualization of what you've just said is, yes, it actually, where you can get good collaboration. So the Sutherland Peninsula have come forward 
and the towns of Dornick and Helmsley and a couple of others have said, we actually want to work collaboratively because we've got golf, we've got whiskey, we've got heritage, we've got uh, wild tourism, et cetera, et cetera. But we're all very different. So if we try to go off individually, we'll not make much clout. If we all come together as the five towns and actually agree a strategic approach, we can then collaborate, co-invest and get our message out louder and stronger. So I think there are some emerging models. The south of Scotland, again, have come forward saying the new enterprise agency wants to create a focus because towns like Moffat and Castle Douglas, Galashiels, Melrose, Jedburgh, Hoyek, in their own right would be maybe too small to actually make much difference if they were just working in isolation. So SOCI, the new enterprise agency, are looking to run a bid light and improvement district light stroke community improvement district approach. And again, we're hoping that we can get half a dozen uh, test cases where we get much more integration between these towns uh, so they can actually work together and create a more compelling offer than they would be able to do individually. So uh, I honestly, am, whilst this has been a really, really difficult year and you cannot un understate the unimaginable consequences of the uh, pandemic, I am glass half full because I have seen so much over the last couple of months of people just saying, right, let's let's crack on. Let's just roll up our sleeves and work together. And all those historic political differences and the little fiefdoms that people had smashed away because people need help. And that's the key thing. I, I have been my breath has been taken away by how much good work has been done. And I know people are coming to the end of their tether and you always get like that when you see the finishing line couple more months of behaving ourselves and then remembering what we done at the teeth of that pandemic where we just helped everybody everybody you know came forward with solutions and, and tried their best local authorities pivoted very quickly got support out at a scale that's never been seen before and they've done it selflessly so did community groups you know working long hours helping the vulnerable development trusts across the country stepped up to the plate and really shone so honestly i think this is a time that Here's the message of learning. Local partnerships and collaborations are the way forward. We need to get the money down from government to allow those communities to make decisions that they know are best themselves because they know what problems need to be fixed. We need to trust them because we've seen how good they've been during the pandemic. Let's not forget that this happened and continue with this approach moving forward. Right. I really am going to have to go now because you know okay. what it's like with Northern Ireland. If you don't turn up in time, you probably send somebody chasing you. <laughs> and with my accent, I don't want to be chased down by them boys. Quite right. Well, Phil, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much on behalf of everybody uh, for giving us your time today. Really appreciate it. We won't thank you. All okay. the best. Look forward to Thanks. working with you. Thanks very much. Um, there's some questions more that came in for Phil, but we'll we'll find a way of, of taking those forward um, as we go on with the rest of the programme. So we'll move on swiftly because we are aiming for a 4.30 finish. Um, and that uh, after, after Phil's uh, excellent introductory piece. We'll move on next to uh, Carolyn Powell from the Huntley Development Trust, um, which is one of Aberdeenshire's shining lights, I have to say. Um, and we're going to get a showcase of the magnificent work that's been going on in Huntley. Uh, Carolyn has an eclectic working history spanning both commercial and third sector organisations for over 40 years. Uh, initially training as a psychiatric nurse, Carolyn moved into the commercial property sector and eventually into managing the Midlands Region Property Division of a high street bank. And then following her passion for design, she built up a design, build and project management business alongside two rural shops. And over time, she became heavily involved in both rural and urban regeneration, which proved to pass for her future. What followed was a journey which has evolved, involved working uh, working with many organisations, including the New Economics Foundation in a new enterprise support alongside her own consultancy, which worked closely with those in the creative industries, including helping a wide range of businesses and organisations where their aim was in developing local economic growth and positive change. Moving to Aberdeenshire in 2016, Carolyn began working for HDT, Humble Development Trust, in 2019 in her current role as Town Centre Development Management. And as I said at the start, there's some really exciting things happening in Humphrey, which is a town not without its challenges. Um, but Carolyn's going to tell us all about that. So, Carolyn, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and good afternoon, everyone. There is a small temptation to say, can you hear me at the back? But um, I'll, I won't do that one. Um, 
To begin with, I'd like to give you a little bit of background to Huntley and our number 30 project and Huntley for those who perhaps don't know it as well. Um, Huntley is a small market town of about four and a half thousand people. It's also the main centre for the rural district. Um, so the catchment population is around 11,000 people. The town's got the benefit of being about halfway between Aberdeen and Inverness with a railway station and that's quite close to the town centre. So it makes it an ideal place to live and work. Um, Huntley Development Trust was formed around 11 years ago and worked very hard to develop a base income stream for the trust. And they did that through the purchase of 63 acres of land up at Green Myers, which is just a few miles out of Huntley, and on which they built a wind turbine um, in 2014 and in 2019 an eco bothy on the land. The trust also secured an interest in other wind farms to generate an income for the trust and also for distribution of pots of funding to other community organisations in the area. This helps towards paying for core staff and to match um, fund grant applications, which is something we know can be challenging. During those 11 years, Huntley Town has been through enormous change, the decline in the retail sector and changes in the way people use the town. Um, obviously, there's been a development of two large supermarkets just on the edge of the town with far fewer people around during the day and the centre of town being quite empty at night, it feels disconnected and sometimes a little bit desolate. This reached a peak uh, with the very last of the town's four banks closing just last week. There are a number of excellent businesses in Huntley who have worked really hard to adapt to change, but the town needs much more as we look at how town centres can work for communities. Over generations, the main square has been the focus of community life and from time to time it still is. An example is the Huntley Hearst and the Room to Run that brings thousands of people into the town, but just for one day a year. Other events bring people in too, but the town struggles to retain them because there's little to keep people engaged. Over time, the Development Trust have looked at various town centre developments, but as we know, timing can be everything. The first town centre acquisition in 2019 was the former RBS building with funding from the Scottish Land Fund and the Town Centre Fund, which had just launched. And we plan to develop this into a co-working facility to bring new entrepreneurs into the town. In 2020, just as we were ready to start the refurbishment, COVID struck. This meant a total rethink because it was quite clear at that point that it could be a couple of years before co-working would be viable. So firstly, we spoke to our funders and then approached the community bookshop in Huntley, which is Orbs, an established social enterprise run by 24 volunteers. They've been looking for new premises in the town. So we developed a plan for them to lease the building for the bookshop after its refurbishment. That timing thing cropped up again because we were able to negotiate with the TSB, which was the last bank to close, to operate a banking support service to be run out of a meeting room in the building one day a week. And this will prov provide a, a much needed facility as the town now has no bank. I'm delighted to say the bookshop took occupation on the 1st of February and are already prov proving to be quite a draw um, as people are trying to get in as they're still unpacking the books. Um, being flexible and being prepared to rethink plans is imperative with projects like this. As we now know, anything can happen and it can change things totally. We have to be prepared to adapt to these changes. So number 30, um, hoping you can see my backdrop, but it's actually looks as though I'm sitting in there at the moment, which I'm not. Um, it's a large former department store in the main square that closed down in 2018. Trust bought it in July 2019, again with funding from the Town Centre Fund and immediately began developing plans for its future. Thanks to the Huntley Town team who developed a strategy for the town, the room to thrive, and together with a number of engagement events, the community has been quite vocal in how they envisage the future town centre. These became the core of the initial plans. Even the name number 30 came from one of the primary school pupils in a project showing, it was just showing their children's ideas for the town. That's uh, how it came about. This project will transform an iconic listed building. It's about 1,280 square metres in the very centre of the town. 
and it'll transform it into a high quality, fully accessible, sustainable and intergenerational centre that's fit for the future. Unusually for older buildings in Huntley, the space is largely open plan, so it's got a, quite a good degree of flexibility in how the space is used. Um, the, my background shows about one quarter of one floor, so you can see it's vast. When it's completed, it'll provide inspirational space for a mix of opportunities in enterprise, skills development, training, learning, all blended with much needed leisure and recreation activities. Town centres can offer so much more than they ever have and in a different way than they have historically. The main aims of this project are to develop a high quality, environmentally sustainable, and fully accessible mixed use anchor building that can respond to the community's needs for the future. To create good quality full and part time jobs and provide career development opportunities. Provide inspirational spaces for the whole community where new opportunities can be created through sharing, development of skills and knowledge. This will safeguard an iconic duly listed building to lift both the town's physical appearance and everyone's mood. Plus, it will act as a catalyst for increased confidence and further investment in Huntley. Now a little bit about how it will be used. Um, within it, youth led innovation space in partnership with the local academy and youth focused organisations. Now, this will be creative space away from the classroom where youngsters can innovate, perform drama, music, make recordings, exhibit their work and build their own projects. A place for young people and their parents, helping to encourage the high percentage of parents who don't engage with the school. And they can share in the children's activities. And there'll be youth volunteering opportunities as well through the cinema and the cafe. There'll be learning and training spaces for the whole community and organisations to use. Um, good quality with the ever important high speed fiber broadband, private meeting areas for confidential discussions, breakout spaces, a cafe, access to kitchen facilities, all of which will be fully accessible. There's a cafe within it, 40 cupboards and a healthy food offer. That will be able to cater for events and help provide the much needed evening economy. It will provide four training places, two in the kitchen and two front of house. There's also exhibition space for local activities, art, youth projects, for designer makers, community events, whatever anybody wants to use it for. Then there's a cinema. Now the cinema is an event cinema as well as being a mainstream cinema uh, or a lecture theatre, has retractable seating, um, performance space, conference space, 60-seater, bring footfall to the town centre. So it can host a variety of smaller scale events uh, and activities making access to culture more affordable and accessible, especially for those on low income with the need to travel avoided. The venue can also support local performance, so whether it's yoga, dance for all ages, intergenerational exercise, rehearsal space, it can be used. We're also talking about the remaker, a remakery, some may be familiar with this, but um, a remakery brings multiple benefits for people and the environment. Um, skills development, enterprise opportunities and reuse of resources and might operate in tandem with other venues throughout the town. All kinds of items can be selected for remaking. Um, it's, it's circular economy in action. Um, a remaker. Then there's the Green Travel Hub together with heritage and visitor information. So one stop shop offering ticket sales, booking forms, maps, walking and cycling routes, timetables, general information, what there is to see and do and how to access it in a low carbon and active way. Plus the co-working we'd hoped to house in the RBS previously um, can be sited uh, in the building. So a mixture of fixed and hot desks. Um, and people can be supported in their businesses, network, share, collaborate and benefit from the super fast broadband. Given the building size, the space that's available is tailored to meet social distancing requirements as they are now. Uh, that's the design, so it can grow when things change and hopefully they will. The finished building itself is entirely focused on the needs of its users and what it aims to deliver. So in practical terms, it had to incorporate total accessibility over the two and a half floors. So there's a passenger lift that will reach all levels. Much of the space has been adapted um, to be adaptable, so it can easily be subdivided with acoustic screening. 
It'll be easy to navigate around the building for anyone with physical or cognitive difficulties. There'll be plenty of natural light with the reinstatement of its original windows and doors. Designed to have natural ventilation throughout, together with a fully sustainable air source heating system, heating and cooling system, I should say, um, and that's supported by solar PV. And we're reusing and repurposing lots of materials and insulating it to within an inch of its life. Now, if all that weren't enough, it has to have intergenerational appeal. We've got around 2,000 youngsters at the Gordon schools who are a bit disconnected from the town and the community, and don't have places of their own to develop things. Plus, we've got an older, grow, a growing older population, clearly I'm one of those, um, many of whom are isolated and disconnected from others. And we have young families who want to mix and have the opportunity to meet in the town. There are no grand design features in this plan. Uh, the money is being ploughed into the building infrastructure and to ensure its future sustainability. But to appeal to all groups is a big task, but it's entirely doable. So we went through the design team process in 2020 and actually going through it with COVID at the fours really helped us look at the way we can use the building in relation to the issues that it brought with it, because there's a real possibility that people will behave differently in the future and have different needs from buildings. In January, um, on the 21st at 9.56, don't know why I remember that, we were thrilled to hear that we've been successful in securing the £2.5 million from Scottish Government Regeneration Capital Grant Fund for this project. And a huge thanks go to Aberdeenshire Council for amazing support with this. And we're just waiting to hear if an application to Historic Environment Scotland has been successful towards the conservation element of the exterior, but that's in proportion uh, a much smaller uh, bid. So we've now got planning, listed building consent and a building one. So ready to go out to tender. Now, the next two years are made up of two distinct elements. The build, which will take place over the next 14 to 18 months, and the community involvement with the project taking it into the future. As a community owned asset, it's planned that number 30 will also be a community managed and operated um, facility. And since the funding announcement, many people have been coming forward who want to be actively involved. And no doubt this group will grow and develop over the coming months. There's a huge excitement about the whole project. We've learned and experienced many things through this process. And just a few of those that have really helped us, um, I'll just run through. It's true that if we weren't passionate about these projects, we couldn't do them. And sometimes keeping positive and focused in the face of the many barriers we can come across can be hard to do. Passion and energy are contagious. However, so is negativity. So forming and keeping a support group of other energised and positive people can be really helpful. Feedback is always good, but feedback is only information unless we act on it. An odd one at the moment, uh, but get out more. <laughs> um, network where we can, either digitally or when it's possible in person. It's an incredibly valuable way of learning from others and benefiting from the enormous amount of skills and knowledge and experience out there. We were lucky to have visited a number of projects prior to lockdown, which was very, very helpful. We all love talking about what we're doing and sharing what we can, being curious and asking questions, but not just noting the facts and figures, but what was it about the places that impressed us and what would make us use those places, the places we saw, the places we've been to? There's a huge amount to learn this way. Sometimes we need specialist knowledge and skills and there are many people out there who will help us find them. Others helped by sharing what helped them. And that's what we've had and the signposting to specialists and experts. Organisations like the Scottish Civic Trust who are here today, whose support to us has been invaluable along with organisations like the Heritage Trust Network, um, who really helped us too. Being adaptable and prepared to review and challenge the plans. So a good group of critical friends can really help with staying on track and avoid the magpie scenario where sometimes we're attracted towards the shiny stuff. Sometimes timing's key, so we need to be flexible enough to adapt if the timing isn't right. Use the resources that are available. The Aberdeenshire Council Town Centre Toolkit launched here is a great resource. Calling people, asking for help, 
There are no such things as silly questions when we're developing these projects. People love helping one another. Often, all we have to do is ask. All the dilemmas we've had, someone else will have, and they've maybe found a way to resolve them, and perhaps they'll share them. Network, talk, share, it's all incredibly useful and can't be stressed enough. What we're all doing is helping to shape a better future for all of us, and there's never been a better or more crucial time than right now to do this. We've had a huge amount of supportive help, and every piece of it has been useful. The next two years for us are going to be very busy, sometimes challenging, but mostly it will be very exciting. So finally, it remains for me to thank Aberdeenshire Council for organising this event and to thank you all for listening. Thank you. Carolyn, thank you. Thank you very much for that. That was that was tremendous. Um, and we'll come back and, and we'll pick up some of that, I, I think. I'm, pretty confident let's say there'll be some questions coming when we get to that section of the <coughs> agenda later on um, but thank you very much for sharing all of that with us and um, the very best of luck from us to Huntley and, and to you and the Huntley Development Trust for the work you're doing. We'll move swiftly on um, to our next speaker who is Rachel Kennedy uh, from the Bampshire uh, Business Forum. Uh, collaboration is key when it comes to delivering projects. Rachel has been a business owner in Banff for many years um, and with no active business association in place, join forces with other businesses uh, to create the Craft Art Vintage Antiques Trail, which has gone from strength to strength, resulting in the newly formed Bam Bamshire Business Forum. And I've known Rachel for quite a while, I think, uh, from the days when you lived in Duff House. We were fearfully grand, uh, but uh, it's very nice to see you again, Rachel, and uh, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It is a real pleasure to be to be here giving an example of a successful business collaboration. I would like to talk very briefly about our Carver Trail leaflet and uh, to talk a little bit about what it is, to maybe give an idea of what I think our successes were, a few tips and some reflections on what we've learnt. Let. So what is the Carver Trail? The Carver Trail is a retail leaflet with a map of Banff to guide you round the historic town. By, the by providing addresses and opening hours of shops, museums and businesses, it aims to encourage visitors to enjoy some shopping and to visit the attractions and cafes in the area. The idea behind a walking trail had originally been discussed by the Banff Preservation and Heritage Society as a way to highlight cultural aspects of the town. Carver, which stands for Craft, Art, Vintage and Antiques, was created in 2017 by a group of eight independent businesses based in Lower Banff, so we were off the main high street thoroughfare. We took up the idea to link up the town's history with its creative businesses. A grant from Aberdeenshire Council's Banff and Macduff Enterprise Challenge Fund enabled us to get the project off the ground. We commissioned a local designer to, strike, to create a striking logo and a DL size leaflet with a simple map to enable customers to easily find our shops and businesses. We're doing a very basic basic thing here. Here is the leaflet, which you may not have seen with its map of Banff in between. In our launch year in 2018, match funding from the council supported the design, print and distribution of 10,000 leaflets and a little bit of advertising. In the second and third years, the group joined grew to 11 members as new businesses arrived in the town and wanted to join us. Continued support from the council during the following years meant that we could extend our reach by commissioning a marketing specialist to promote the leaflet through targeted advertising and press releases to a wider specialist audience interested in museums, craft, art, vintage and antiques. An Instagram account was set up to complement the Facebook page that we had already created and the leaflet print run was increased to 20,000. 
The distribution area also expanded geographically to include key art sites such as the V&A Dundee, which was really exciting for us. Today we have a strong core group of shops and businesses. We have a Facebook page of 475 likes and an Instagram account with 148 followers. Due to COVID restrictions preventing the circulation of our leaflet last summer, we will continue to use it into this year. The Carver Trail has been a great success. It's attracted visitors and additional spend to Banff and Macduff, and it's brought new customers to all of our businesses. To date, leaflets have been on display at a range of locations, including Aberdeen Airport and Railway Station, various hotels, larger retail outlets, caravan parks, golf clubs, leisure centres, heritage sites and visitor attractions across the northeast. We've had visitors from Australia, Spain, America using the leaflet as part of their holiday plans. And closer to home, folk have travelled to Banff, especially to follow the trail. They've come from Inverness, Elgin, Aberdeen, Inverurie, Fraserburgh, Ellen and Tariff, and that is just to mention a few of the locations that we have recorded. All of the businesses involved have reported increased sales from more customers and even our distributors, Take One Media, commented on the fast take up of the leaflet as soon as it was launched. So why or how has it worked? Aberdeen to Council's Enterprising Challenge Fund aims were to encourage collaborative projects between businesses and organisations and there had to be more than six businesses working together in order to qualify for the 50% support. To encourage businesses to play their part in developing civic pride to be innovative and improve vibrancy to the town and to show an increase in footfall to the town centre. We have achieved all of these aims through the following actions. We built on the strengths that we already had and we used resources that were already there. And I think it's a really good point to say that Banff is a very walkable town and because of the varied nature of the location with its beautiful coastline, great views, the River Deveron and Marina, the golf course and spaced out parking areas all played a part and lends itself to exploring on foot or perhaps on bicycle. So you park your car, you get out your car and you walk. Producing a leaflet for lovers of history and culture, and let's face it, those who like to rake for a bargain, worked really well with the backdrop of Banff's historic architecture, the old harbour, the Kirkyard, Duff House and Banff Castle, and not forgetting a great selection of charity shops. It also worked because the leaflet is very easy for everyone to use. You literally, we literally took a lot of the legwork out of it. So, for example, a couple who are staying the weekend in the area could make the most of a mini break and newcomers to the town could use it as a handy guide. The map made it simple to find the various locations, even if English wasn't your first language, and the trail could be used in any way you wanted. So there wasn't a fixed beginning or end, it was a circular route. One visitor to my shop was delighted on being handed a leaflet and said, that's my afternoon all mapped out. And another said, we would never have found these shops because we don't know the town. And since the Tourist Information Centre in Banff closed in 2018, a leaflet was very practical. Everyone on the Carver Trail had leaflets to hand out as well as other locations in the area, such as caravan parks, the local library, and customers were grateful to have the information in a slim, easy flyer that could be popped into a bag or into a back pocket. And let's face it, not everyone uses the internet, uh, including many of our key customer age groups. And as internet reception can sometimes be patchy, it helped to have a leaflet to hand. 
I would say that distribution and collaboration have made all the difference for us. None of the businesses could have afforded this kind of marketing reach individually, but working together meant we reached over 400 venues. And through working together, it's also enabled us to share our skills, our knowledge, and importantly, to support one another. So emphasizing what Caroline has been talking about in, in, her, in her talk. And it really was a team effort. Someone volunteered to deliver the leaflets to Aberdeen for distribution. Someone took on the role of producing the design brief. We had to work closely with a designer and a photographer. We had to agree a budget and commit our own money for the greater good of the group. The project forced us to engage and also to trust one another. Producing a marketing brochure was a new experience for many of us and so skills such as commissioning the leaflet and thinking about logos and marketing and practical issues of design, content, photography, social media, posting. It's all been an added learning experience for us. In our evaluation report, one of the Carver businesses reported back that a customer said how wonderful it was to see small businesses working together and supporting one another like this. And this was commented on quite a bit. So in terms of tips, I just want to finish by, by mentioning briefly a couple of things that I hope might be helpful to groups working on projects or thinking of funding. Quality, number one, quality. The Carver leaflet design was meant to attract the eye. We chose a logo and a colour to really stand out. The silver lettering on the front cover is to reflect the history of Banff's silversmithing past. And it also ties in neatly with one of the venues on the trail, the Smiddy silversmithing studio. Always keep in mind who your audience and your customer is and what they want and what they need. And following on from that, having a social media platform is important because it allows interaction between business and customer. We can promote our businesses as often as we like on our Facebook page. We can highlight new stock arrivals. We can promote events and workshops. We can flag up practical information like shop closures, updates on roadworks, parking restrictions. We can link up with other businesses and national shop local campaigns like the hashtag just a card on Instagram. And Instagram is ideal for us because it enables us to use our best feature. Our varied art, craft, antique and vintage stock can create visually appealing posts to attract like minded customers. So what have we learned? Limitations time and timing. We learnt in our very first year that we needed to get our leaflet out earlier in the season. It had to be ready at the absolute latest late March and definitely ready for Easter. Also, since we are all sole traders, mostly sole traders and very busy in our own businesses over the summer, finding time to do the necessary admin and to plan ahead is difficult. There are limitations using a leaflet. Producing your main copy once a year means you haven't got the flexibility to change information. For example, if a business closes or changes their contact details. So I think in that case, having an additional online presence really helps. Volunteer fatigue. I'm sure many of you will be familiar with this. Energy and enthusiasm is incredibly necessary to keep a project going, but it dips, especially when you're sustaining a project over several years. But if you are aware that this can happen, then you can anticipate it. It always takes more time than you think it will when you are working with a group and you cannot always achieve everything. Risk. We live in a risk averse world and trying something new or moving out of your comfort zone in an uncertain economic climate is really challenging, especially when you don't know exactly what the outcome or result might be. 
For example, the Carver Trail wasn't for everyone and some members left after the first year. But to conclude, I hope that we have demonstrated that by the success of the leaflet, that you really can gain greater benefit for your community when you work together and that by aiming high in terms of a quality project, you can be an inspiration to others. And by securing funding like the Enterprise Challenge Fund that actively encourages creative thinking and inventiveness, it's certainly a risk worth taking. Thank you. And then if anyone wants me to send them one of these, just let me know. I have a feeling you'll get quite a few requests there, um, Rachel. <laughs> Thanks very much. I think that was an interest, absolutely fascinating. And it's, it's so good to see the contrast, if you like, or, or, the, or the, the, not the contrast, but the complementary way that in Banff you have a group of businesses who got together to deliver something and in Huntley you've got a more formal community-based group that has got together to do something and, and the, it just shows what can be done in different ways there's no there's no one right way to do it it's, it's whatever is appropriate and, and just um, finally on that um, both Huntley and Banff are very very striking towns architecturally um, the town centres of both are exceptionally beautiful places and really stand out um, in an Aberdeenshire context, but both of them have real challenges um, and real strengths and, and the way that the community in both places are really pulling together um, to tackle the challenges and promote the strengths, I think is, is tremendous. So thank you, Rachel, for that. Um, and we'll move swiftly on. Um, next, we have, um, we have, we have somebody. <laughs> we have Jamie Mac McNamara, sorry, uh, from Scottish Civic Trust. Um, Jamie holds a postgrad diploma in applied building repair plus an MA in conservation. He has worked with the conservation of canals, churches and within the traditional skills area. Jamie has worked on historic regeneration schemes and managing building repair grants. He is a full and active member of the IHBC along with the current chairperson uh, as long as sorry as well along with being the current chairperson of SPAB Scotland. Uh, so he's here uh, on behalf of the, the Scottish Civic Trust um, and he's going to be talking to us about um, developing successful community projects. So Jamie, thank you very much for being with us and over to you. Thank you, Councillor, and thank you everybody here and thank you to Audrey for inviting me to speak today. I'm just going to quickly share my screen, so hopefully you can see this. Bear with me for one second. I think that's that should be visible. OK, so my name is Jamie McNamara. I work for the Scottish Civic Trust and I run a programme called the My Place Mentoring Programme. And as you can see on the screen, it's a programme to support communities, community groups to build their capacity. Um, and it's great to hear Carolyn speaking here today about the Hunty project, of which um, that is one of our projects that we are closely working with them on. So what does the My Place Mentoring do and what is it for? Well, first of all, it's a free program. It's a free mentoring program. So it's designed to help community groups develop their skills, knowledge and connections. And so we basically help groups um, who traditionally don't have access to kind of the heritage support networks and um, those banks of knowledge that are pretty much around the central belt. Um, I am based in Glasgow, but one of the great kind of draws of, of this program is that um, in the old days when I used to be able to, I'd go and visit groups physically, like myself and the director of the trust, Susan O'Connor, came out to visit the Hunting Project um, some time ago, and it was great to, to see a project in that kind of tangible fashion. So. What do, we, what do we help groups do? We help them to develop skills. And I'm kind of talking, generally speaking, we'd have groups at that kind of embryonic stage, that kind of ideas around a table, cup of tea, we've got an idea about a building in our, in our area, what can we do with that building, etc. So we'll kind of tease out the steps, tease out the, the understanding of the different stages and timescales involved with those projects. Uh, I think timescales is critical here because a lot of groups can be a little bit unsure of, of if they want to build a, a visitor experience, that that's going to take time. So we're about trying to kind of reel in expectations and make it kind of realistic as well. 
So I will assist with helping to manage the project, to engage with certain professionals. Um, you know, it, it can be difficult sometimes. How do I get a surveyor? How do I speak to a conservation architect? How do I speak to the local community council? How do I speak to the local authority? I'm not quite sure where to start. So I'm, I, I'm there to kind of help broker those relationships, kind of broker the way that we can do these things to kind of break down barriers, per se. So I can assist them with briefing documents, such as design brief and business plans, and also um, funding applications, because we all may or may not know a fun, funding applications can be quite varied and quite in-depth and quite jargon-filled, and they can be quite, um, they can be quite tricky on times. So community consultation, it's so important to get your community involved um, with your project. And you may get the naysayers, you may get people with negative feedback, but it's, that's also a learning curve. So try to keep everything super, super positive, as Phil was saying earlier on. Think of everything, feedback you get, good and or bad, that it can all help grow your project. So that then falls into, the, or falls onto kind of de uh, developing new and existing audiences. It's great having a project for a town or a village, but that has to be based on what the village needs and what the village wants. Um, I would very much, you know, sh show caution to groups that want to do something that they want to do. There's got to be something that the group um, has engaged with the community and it's best for the local area. So who is eligible? Um, well, pretty much anybody, really. Um, we help communities, as I said, remote communities. Um, from We've got projects up in, up in Wick. We have projects in Inverness, uh, one over in Torrey. Just recently took on a new one in Aberdeen in the city itself. Um, a couple on the Isle of Skye, a few down towards Moffat and Lockerbie. So we're kind of it, and some of them in Paisley and the more deprived parts of Glasgow. So we'll take on projects all over the all over the country. Um, and we do have a couple of spaces free if anybody uh, is interested in signing up. The mentoring programme runs for three years. It comes up for renewal hopefully in February of next year. We take on about 15 or 20 groups per year. We currently have about 14 groups getting mentored. So we do have room for a few more, as I said. Um, and that's kind of how it generally works. Just a few quick examples, just to give you some kind of context. On the top left is a wee little chapel. It's the um, POW, Ukrainian POW chapel down near Lockerbie. And it's a beautiful little tin building um, built by the, the Ukrainian POW. So we're helping them with repairs and how to form a business plan to make this particular kind of offering sustainable. We have Dunbeg Brock on the Isle of Skye. They're interested in, in the construction of a visitor centre that will also be a community space. We have um, Cathcart Cemetery, the top right. So it's a cemetery down the kind of south side of Glasgow. They're interested in developing a walk-in app, an historic app, um, telling the story of, of his very, very close links with, with football. Um, is close links with uh, Stan Laurel. His mother is, is buried there, I believe. And also make it a nature interactive kind of space. So we're helping them put their business plan together for that one. In the middle, we have a Grand Town on Spey. Grand Town on Spey have a, a more of a town approach to their project. They're looking to uplift public realm, put in, uh, reinstall the public toilets that were closed. Have a look at social housing. Um, again, banks have closed down. Had a look at you know more physical space that can be used for community uses within the town itself. We have Canvas Neth and Priory in the bottom right, a fine lump of a building. We are working closely with with the group there to. Their great plan is to get that building back up and running, re-roofed with with a community space inside. Huge project, as you can imagine. There's also the parklands they've got, orchards. So very much a community encompassing kind of scheme. So we're working with them at the first initial stages is about how to get that building into their ownership. Um, in the bottom middle there, we have uh, Creef, which we have a couple of projects in Creef. We have one which is a museum offering. They want to put a museum into the existing town hall. So we're working on the logistics of that one. And a more recent one that's come on board in the last week or two, which is a creative Creef who want to look at maybe um, a cinema offering. So maybe, Carolyn, we can have a chat with you, post this and, and put you in touch. Which brings you nicely on then to, to Carolyn's project here in Huntley um, in the in the bottom left there. Number 30, um, I, I was lucky enough to be there, as I said, with our director back in the day before travel was restricted. It's a wonderful building. We sat down, ha had a really good conversation with Carolyn and some members of the group. And we thrashed some good ideas and we gave some 
advice. We're here to advise in this mentoring program. Uh, we, we don't have to, you don't have to take our advice, but I, I can really, I think a good thing about that from us, we're kind of independent and be that good cop, bad cop viewpoint. So um, it's great news that Huntley got that, got that money recently. Uh, Inverclyde Shed is one of our projects. They also got a half million pound from the RCGF fund as well, which is really, really super. And they're just there. The chapel at the top left again, the Rukanian Chapel, they recently received £13,000 for essential repairs to the roof. So that's kind of what the um, what the programme looks after. It covers everything from governance, business planning, project visioning, community engagement, how best to use social media for your benefit, and of course, fundraising. Um, so I'm, it's a free resource. We give each group between 8, 12, 13 days over the course of six to eight months. Um, of course, I would come out to see groups and hopefully I will again come the summertime. But failing that, we can offer support online, email, team, Zoom, whatever the platform of choice may be. So that's the mentoring programme. My details are in the bottom left um, or else pop on the Scottish Civic Trust website. You'll find me that way. And I'd love to talk to any groups or field any questions. Thank you. Jamie, thank you very much. Um, and it's good to know that you're there and, and, and the experience and, uh, and the independent advice, I think, is, is really helpful. And I've no doubt that uh, colleagues on this call will be hammering on your door before long. And I'm very glad you told me where that bottom middle picture was, which was grief, because I was sitting here thinking, I know that place. <laughs> uh, and you put me out of my misery. So thank you very much for that. Um, we'll move on to our final speaker for today um, and it really is a pleasure to be able to introduce to you uh, my my friend and colleague um, Councillor Anne Sterling. Um, we've known each other Anne and I since uh, the tail end of the last century. Uh, I know we'd neither of us look older enough to, to have done that but um, we have. Um, Anne's had a tremendous uh, career in local government. Uh, she was leader of Aberdeenshire Council for, for many years and a very successful one and has now brought all of her skills and experience to bear on the Communities Committee, uh, which is a very important area of work for uh, the Council. And I'm really pleased that she's here this afternoon to um, talk to us um, and round off the presentations before we get to the Q&A. So Anne, nice to see you and over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Peter, for that. Um, lovely uh, warm welcome it has indeed been um some time since we uh, first met so um hopefully um it will be a, a a conclusion that is that makes some sense this afternoon for you um so i'm absolutely delighted to be here just to um sum up really or round up what we've heard today um and just to emphasize some of the points that have already been made and i think it's very clear to us all that there's a strong thread running through the program the launch of this toolkit today encompasses uh, the messages which all of our presenters um, have shared with us. Uh, Phil, in his uh, introduction or in his um, uh, presentation, was quite clear that the main focus should be on a wide ranging collaboration um, with a holistic partnership approach in, a, in an effort to build um, opportunities within communities. And I think it was very apt that um, he talked about new futures and new focuses for our towns, which quite clearly are um, a key in supporting our local economies. Uh, the Love Local um, project, I think, or, or um, campaign, I think is a, a really, really important and that we should um, all work towards sustaining that lifeblood that he spoke about in terms of the, the, the sustainability of our town centres and our communities in the rural area. I think we're all very, very um, much welcome the opportunities which he um, highlighted in terms of the additional funding that's been announced. And um, we were very um, uh, pleased, I'm sure, um, to be some of the first to know them, that there's new funding streams coming on board. Um, and indeed for the bids for the for the, the larger towns across Aberdeenshire, that additional round of funding, I'm sure, will be most welcome. Um, and I think we'll all um, be very uh, pleased to learn more about the, the gift cards as well, which again is an opportunity for us to encourage people to stay local and shop local and sustain that, um, that centre. But I think, again, one of the clear messages that Phil had for us all was be ambitious. Um, 
concentrate on a place base and um, make sure that our home based populations um, have uh, investment in what is happening within the local community. Caroline um, gave us a fantastic and very impressive example of that holistic approach, um, which uh, includes public, private and voluntary sectors. And I think it's really an exciting opportunity and um, I'm very, very interested and uh, can't wait to see the outcome um, of all the work that goes, uh, is going in to number 30. And certainly in terms of the community's um, aspect of the council, we have an interest, of course, in our um, children and young people, our library service, of course, has, there's an opportunity there too. Um, so look forward to much, much more coming out of that development in number 30. But again, I think one of the key things that Caroline shared with us was that ability to be flexible and adaptable. And I think given that the, the, the uh, uncertainties that are around just now, absolutely crucial um, that we can actually amend our plans to fit the circumstances um, that we all face and the challenges that are around. And again, that intergenerational, intergenerational piece um, is, is again very attractive in terms of building that capacity within our towns and villages. Um, Rachel then followed on and uh, again that thread continued. Um, Rachel described her very successful um, opportunity for inward investment, which is um, borne fruit for the, the um, organisations that have taken part. Um, and the fact that the awareness of the Banff area has been raised, um, that your footfall has increased and that um, the businesses are actually benefiting um, is, is really, really good news um, indeed. And I think that again, building on your strengths, so what have you got within your town centres now? What have you got within your communities now? How can you utilise those to actually the, the ben to benefit the wider um, community? I think it's really, really an important message um, that Rachel gave us there. Um, mutual benefits, trust, I think, again, very, very important. But being aware and being realistic about what's achievable. Um, and again, you know, I think that appetite for risk is again is key on what um, communities will be able to, um, to deliver. And then we have from Jamie about that capacity building also and about the opportunities um, for accessing that excellent bank of information and expertise. So I do hope that you will take that, op that offer um, and, you, and um, it's a free service, which is always attractive, um, but please access that. And when you're thinking of developing um, that embryonic um, project, um, it's it's a, a bank of information I'm sure that would be ideal for you to be able to develop further. So we've, we've heard in addition to all of the offers made by our presenters um, in Aberdeenshire, the council has support available also and through the area managers and teams through the project officer and through um, also the rural development partnerships who can also support and encourage community led projects facilitate engagement and involvement, build community capacity for groups and assist and advise on governance, planning, project funding and delivery. All of the things that you've heard about today that are really crucial to success. Um, our community learning development teams are there also for, again, that community capacity building. Um, but again, what I take from today, uh, again, is, as a clear message is don't wait. Do not wait until the funding has been annou uh, announced. Councillor Gail spoke about this earlier on too. Um, don't, dis don't wait for the funding to be announced and then wonder what to spend it on. If you've got an idea or you're a group who are already working on a project, go and seek that support. It's on offer, it's there. Um, the Aberdeenshire Town Centre Toolkit has an array of projects, tips and advice. So please don't be afraid to contact any of the project leads that have delivered the projects in that tool, uh, that, that have been um, rehearsed there. Um, if it's similar to your own or indeed not necessarily similar, but just to get some of those key principles, um, some help with those key principles. Work with other groups and organisations where possible. And please don't be afraid to write up a wish list of deliverabilities or work projects up so that you're at that shovel ready stage. You're ready to go. Um, as soon as any funding becomes available, you can take that forward. 
All support and fund funding links will be on the Town Centre page on the Council's website, along with details of the Scotland Town Partnership and any other agencies that may be useful to you in support of your project. The toolkit also showcases some of the exemplar projects that have been delivered throughout Aberdeenshire, and there are many, many more than you've heard of today. Um, but again, a huge resource available through Rachel, Carlin uh, and others who have spoken to you this afternoon. So please, if you are thinking of or working on an idea, get in touch and officers and others will be able to direct you and signpost you to the most appropriate source of information that you might um, find useful. So again, thank you all very, very much. Um, I hope that you've taken much out of the presentations today. Um, I certainly have learned a lot um, and I'll be handing back to Councillor Argyle uh, now, who will then um, take forward the question and answer session. So thank you all very much. And thank you very much. Um, that's a, an excellent summary of, of what's been a, a, a tremendous afternoon, I have to say. Uh, so we have now um, time for some questions and actually quite a reasonable bit of time so we can have some, some quite useful discussion. Um, we're scheduled to finish at half past four, so we'll see how we go with, with questions. I've been trying to keep track of them as they've been coming in um, and uh, so hopefully I won't get in a complete nut and muddle. It's likely, but hopefully we'll avoid it. Uh, but we'll start off some time ago. We we heard about the town and centre, a uh, town and city gift card, and there's a question put by Duncan McCaskill um, asking whether there'll be uh, will there be associated costs after year one. And I happen to know because a little bird told me that Audrey can answer that one, so I'll go to Audrey for that one first off. Thank you, Councillor Gale. Um, yeah, so as Phil mentioned at the very start, we, we do our very best to be as proactive as possible with, with all the projects and, and all the strands of information that we hear from Scotland's Town Partnership and Scottish Government. And um, because everything seems to come out, especially, you know, um, with the pandemic, with all the, the funding coming out as, as fast as possible, um, we, we, we try to be as proactive with, with these projects as possible. So we have started looking at costs and we've had discussions with many town centres who are really keen on the gift card and possibly the loyalty card over the last year. But that sticking point is that revenue, ongoing revenue and maintenance costs. So the discussions that are going on at the minute is looking to see if we can build that into some kind of package to take it additional to that one year. Um, so we're, we're looking at a few options, but at the minute we're, we're really considering if we could maybe go in for a Aberdeenshire wide round of the next round of the Scotland Loves Local Fund to be able to maybe put together a two to three year package that would, would cover um, the, the loyalty card and the gift card. So we're working on the back of that and, and we'll come back to all the times with, with information as soon as we can get some more clarity. Um, so I hope that answers your question. And I think I would just say, watch the space. We'll, we'll come back to you as soon as we can. Great, Audrey, thank you very much. Um, I should have said that some of, some of the questions that have gone up have already been answered. So if they've been answered on the, on the conversation bar, um we'll 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 leave leave those alone um but uh, the next one i picked up was from dawn tuckwood um and she asks um have you seen some young people uh, coming back to their communities to set up businesses um so i wonder if carolyn could would you like to pick up on that one first and then maybe rachel if you want to come in after carolyn and and whether that is happening i know one of the hats I wear is is on the board. I'm on the board of the Cairngorms National Park, and that's certainly happening in a lot of uh, Cairngorms communities. Actually, as a result of, of the park status, as much as anything, um, there are lots of younger people coming back and starting businesses. But are we seeing that in Huntley and, and in Banff? Carolyn, do you want to start? Uh, thank you. Um, well, we hope to see it. Um, one of the main reasons for getting young people involved in the project as, as early as possible is that they start to feel you know really invested in the town centre and it's about them um, and making opportunities for jobs for volunteering and even if they do go away um, for a period you know education whatever the hope is they come back and maybe bring you know additional skills back 
But it's really at this stage, it's about making sure that people feel, you know, it's all about it's about them um, and that there is a future, um, that it isn't somewhere they need to escape from and never come back. So I think over time, that's, that's something that we'll be able to, to track and be able to see. But, you know, that's that's the desire is for that to happen. Thank you. Rachel, is there anything you want to, to add on that I one? I probably would 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 support what Carolyn has said. The the Bampshire Business Forum is is a very new group, so we haven't got a lot of members at the moment. Um, but it is something that I will feed back to the group at our next committee meeting. And I know that there is a lot of interest in in the committee, particularly to encourage and support young entrepreneurs, um, apprenticeship schemes, that sort of thing, very much to, to keep to keep youngsters um, living and working in the area. So yes, I, I will pass that on. Great, thank you very much. Um, now I'm not quite sure who, who's best place to answer the next one, which is uh, Samantha Rawlins' question um, that came in about um, cottage industries, small, small enterprises that don't have premises. Um, so whether uh, Audrey's is one for you or whether you can pass it on, um, but will there be support for cottage industries that don't have a premises, but do support their local place economy? And we see a lot of that in um, more rural settlements, and it's absolutely true. Uh, Audrey, can you kick off that one and, and maybe bring somebody else in if you think that's appropriate? Yeah, sure. And I, and I guess it depends what um, support. I mean, it's maybe something I can take back off the table with with Sam after this. Um, I guess it depends what kind of um, support you're meaning. Is it um, sort of COVID support at the moment, um, Sam, or is it um, actually looking at um, sort of enterprising and, and growing the business? Um, so I guess it really depends on the clarity of the, the, the question there. Can I come in, Audrey, save your room? Of course. It was more to do when Phil was talking about the card to support local and everything and recognising that local isn't just those with the premises on the high street. There is a whole set of cottage industries that are feeding into that as well. And are they going to be included, not forgotten? Because we have a lot of them across my area in particular, being so rural, where there isn't this huge hub of shops, but everybody right now wants to support local. So how can we yeah. support those without a premises to be involved in any initiatives so they benefit? And we sustain them as well. Otherwise, if all this is being put into the high street, which is vitally important, I'm not saying it's not, but if we don't support those that are supporting the high street, they might not exist. Thank you for that. That really helps. And um, Sam, so yeah, to answer your question, the way that the loyalty, uh, the gift card actually works is it's a MasterCard. So any business um, within reason, apart from obviously one or two interest industries that we wouldn't want to necessarily encourage, um, but anybody, basically any business with a, a credit card um, facility machine um, can be included within the project. So um, to answer your question, um, Sam, yeah, any of those rural um, cottage industries that have that facility will, will be able to take part and be involved. That's great. Thank you very much. And we'll move on uh, with a question specific, fairly detailed question for, for Rachel. So we'll, we'll take that one next, which is what were the main reasons for those who chose to leave after the first year? And that's a question from Peter. I think without wishing to divulge sort of personal information, I think it probably was that a couple of years ago, 2017, when we were getting together, it was really businesses were 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 struggling to find extra money to, to fund something like that so although the amount was was fairly modest it was a hundred pounds to to be part of it um i i think that that was that was too much so it so finance financial really i think would be the answer okay that's fine thank you very much um, and we'll move on to um, a question that's put it, been put in by um, David McRobin, uh, which is coming by email. Uh, but thinking local and small, where is the starting point? Forming a group, having a plan, having funding, what advice can you share? So I think that's probably one for you, Carolyn, I'm afraid. So um, <laughs> there you go. Oh, it's, it's, like being, it's like being a, a deity here. I can just <laughs> Anyway, Carolyn. 
have a go at that one. Where do you start? Uh, yeah, where do you well, start? You start by talking to people, um, sounding it out, really finding out who's interested. You know, some, inevitably um, with new ideas, people like to put their sort of, you know, 10 pence within. And from that, you'll get people who might want to join in. You'll get people who might want to offer something. And it kind of is like a snowball. So that begins and it says it starts rolling down the hill. You gather people and then you start branching out a little bit. I'm mixing my metaphors here, so it's not very good, uh, but you get the idea and then start to talk to people. You know, one of the biggest things about all these projects is talk to people. I mean, I, I can talk to Scotland, but um, it is so important. Talk to other people about everything, you know, whether it's the project, whether it's the place, whether it's the people, all of those things. You will get the kind, it'll, it starts to form a picture. It seems a bit, bit, bit sort of fuzzy at the beginning, but as you talk to people, the whole thing starts to develop and, and you know that's that's the beginning that's my answer <laughs> thanks very much i saw rachel you were nodding to a lot of that would you like to share your experience of uh, starting a group what was it that kicked it off out of that uh, having a group having a plan having an idea finding funding where, did, where was the starting point well, I, I would say one of the nicest things or one of the benefits of living in a smaller community is, is that if you are generally someone who gets out and about and who, who likes to get involved, you, you will pick up on contacts and, and you'll start looking. I think I'm someone who naturally looks for links and contacts and, and similarities when I'm talking with people anyway. But, but for us with the Carver Trail, it really came from the, the, um, the Banff Heritage Society already talking about wouldn't it be lovely and starting having walks around the town this is another thing we'd love to do is guided guided tours so the idea of using the town as a way of attracting people into it that's sort of where that started and also i think we most of the businesses involved with our trail because they are linked already thematically around vintage antiques crafts and interest in that sort of thing we all knew one another anyway. I mean, the, it sort of, so it actually grew quite organically. But for us, the massive difference was the fact that the funding opportunity came up. And that's when we grabbed, that's when we said, right, OK, we've got to do something. We've got to use this. We've got to take advantage of this situation. So that really accelerated us and, and, and formed the, the idea quite quickly. Great, thank you. Um, Jamie, you must have people coming knocking on your door at the very start of, of a process. Do you want to, to share some of your experience of that question? Yes, indeed. I think um, where the best place to start is to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Um, and what I mean by that is I have I had a, one of my groups, and this is, where I, this is where the good cop, bad cop thing comes in. I sat in a, a living room with one of my groups of uh, eight, nine, ten people. And I asked them all individually to write down in three short sentences or words what the project actually is that they're trying to achieve. And out of eight people, I got like 25 different answers. So I thought, okay, right, there's something wrong here. Okay, this, there's something not quite adding up. So we didn't leave that room until we were all agreed on what that project was. And I was just there merely as a sounding board. So if you're all, if you know, if you're all pointing in the right direction or the same direction, you have a much better chance of having splinter groups going off in different things. And just to echo what Carolyn said there as well about it's 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 great having ideas and we 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 wouldn't be here if it was wasn't for community groups wanting to take on buildings and take on areas and, and places. Um but you need that to be part of the community's want and need as well. So engage with the community, uh, get good feedback, take the negative feedback as well, and use it all in a very positive way. So the inception point is don't think of funding just yet. Get a good group, get your volunteers, get the the project vision set out first of all. You don't need to worry about things like business plans, things like funding strategies, five years down the road. Make sure you're all uh, agreed, um, enthusiastic, got the right volunteers, admit that you may be lacking skill sets. So if you don't have a skill set that you require, like somebody with good governance, a good fundraising background, um, somebody with a gift of the gap, which can be very, very good when you're talking to a building relationship, whatever. Admit that you need those skill sets. You know, don't let ego get in the way, you know, and seek help from others. I think if you get all those things right, you're pretty much halfway there. 
That's really helpful. Yeah, thanks, thanks Jamie. Uh, we'll move on swiftly then. Uh, there's a question that uh, has been emailed through uh, asking about support in Aberdeenshire for help with business plans. And I see um, the nameless, I'm afraid, so I don't know who actually you are, but Greenpeace Bamfish, Bamfish Chair and Company Founder, um, who's on the call, has answered it uh, in terms of Business Gateway, um, which is, is clearly very helpful. Um, Audrey, can I come to you? Do you want to, from Aberdeenshire Council point of view, um, once a, a group gets to the point of needing a business plan, is a support and help through Aberdeenshire? And then once you've answered, perhaps, uh, Carolyn and, and Rachel, is there anything that you want to add to that from your experience, um, how it actually works on the ground? But Audrey, for you first, maybe. Of course, yeah, I'd just like to say, and I think June's already pointed out in the chat, that we've got um, um, four business development executives at Aberdeenshire Council within the economic development that will also help um, point groups in the right direction with regards to supporting business plans and um, funding opportunities. But actually, Councillor Gail, it would be good if we could pull in um, Kate Redknapp, who's um, on the call today, who is representing the Rural Development Partnerships, which is a great asset um, within Aberdeenshire um, Council that um, a partner of the council that can um, assist and help the groups right through everything that's been discussed. So I think Kate's on the call if we can just pull her in to give a little bit of um, information on what the rural partnerships can actually support with, if that's okay. No, that's a, a tremendous idea. Thank you very much. So Kate, if you're with us, these things get more and more like seances, don't they? Uh, is anybody there? But Kate, if you're there, um, and, I believe and she, I believe she left the call. Um, it's maybe Jackie. If we can pull Jackie's. All right, okay, Jackie. Jackie. Yeah. Are you here, Jackie? Right over to you then. Hi. Yes. Now, um, yes, of course, um, the six rural partnerships is quite unique um, that Aberdeenshire has. This um, sort of grassroots. Um, um, driven um, organisations that really get really understand and know their local communities and we can provide a whole range of um, of the support similar to, to what has been already um, described you know, from project planning, funding, community consultation and meaningful engagement um, to dealing with governments cutting through red tape um, as I know uh, a lot of groups having worked with the council feel, oh gosh, there's all this red tape, but we we are, are you know, so connected with, with our local colleagues, we know who, who they need to ask straight away so they're not being banded from pillar to post. And, um, and a range of sort of evidence gathering. And just to go back to the previous question, one of the things that we sort of look at is sort of um, when you, you look at a project is talking about pre-planning, so sort of kind of encouraging groups to sort of have a look at what opportunities there are in their area already you know what what do you already know about your community the size its history geography what assets there are what previous challenge um, projects were there what were the challenges and what's worked well in the past and what actually matters to the community as well so having those really good conversations so that you're not coming up with an idea that you think is a good idea but it's totally disconnected with the people that you're, you're working you're, you're trying to help and you know, and then we we're here and be part of that conversation to let you know what support resources are available. So when you have got a robust plan in place, then you know it's that time. And we are very keen to sort of encourage groups to build a good plan. Don't sort of have your eye on the prize at the end. So don't have your eye on the funding or an eye on the building. You know, have 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 a plan. We'll find a building to house your pro your project. We'll find the funding to fund that um, going forward. And it's 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 all too often we find there's this need to chase the funding. So it's great to hear that we're trying to move away from these short deadlines because ultimately the fear the funding's lost means that we shoehorn projects into a funding package, which maybe hasn't been thought through as well as it could be. And that's why sometimes they don't work and then that perpetuates that sort of fear of risk. Um, and be sort of mindful as well about what matters to our potential stakeholders. You know, they want to see our communities to be wealthier, fairer, smarter, healthier, safer, stronger, greener, etc. And um, it's just really making sure there's a genuine need that can be addressed and um, work to define the project more thoroughly. And you know, make sure that there actually it, it, there is an actual need that you're, you're you're going to go out there. But 
you know, all sex partnerships we are very unique and work to to be very sort of independent with regards to what we do because it fits in with our area but we all offer a very similar similar um cohesive service as as the, the rural partnership federation i think i've probably waffled on enough there <laughs> It wasn't waffle at all, Jackie, and very nice <laughs> to see you. Thanks, thanks for joining and taking that question. Um, I, I will just take in um, Carolyn and, and Rachel in, in that order. I mean, you, you must have been doing business plans and thinking about these things. So um, just anything quickly you want to add on, on what's been, been said there? Um, Carolyn, first. Well, I mean, from our point of view, <laughs> it's, it's hard because, you know, we We've all, as a, as a team, done quite a few business plans before. That doesn't mean we don't need help. It, again, it's talking to the organisations, um, getting you know, getting as much uh, support with it, because you know, a business plan sounds easy, but when you start getting beneath the surface, there's a lot of research, a lot of background to be done, and you know, it's about that. You know, you need to build the capacity to be able to develop all that. So there are great people out there who'll help help to do it. Um, that's without a doubt. That's great, thank you. And Rachel? Well, interestingly, we didn't have a business plan. We don't have a business plan. Our project, I think, is a very simple one, and it was in response to a funding opportunity. So totally, we were 100% supported by Aberdeen Council through the funding process. Um, and the criteria of the, of the support structured our response and I think also structured and um, influenced our development. Um, I mean we, we were we were expected to offer something extra each each year we received uh, support. so but I but I don't think the group should be put off by not necessarily having a, a business plan a, a bit you know it, it's got to fit whatever your your project is. So um, don't let that put anyone off. You can still be successful. <laughs> <laughs> that is good to get that other perspective. That, that's I, I think really valuable. It's been it's been the whole theme through this afternoon's discussion, um, and that's great. There's there's no one single answer for all of these things, um, but we need to think about how the success is going to be measured. And there's a very good question from Ian Phillip, who's from the Stonehaven Business Association. Um, and I shall give Stonehaven a plug as well because it's another stunning Aberdeenshire town, well worth visiting if you haven't already. Um, but Ian, Ian is asking how these ideas and, fund, and, and funding are going, are going to be measured in terms of their success and how will this relate back to the Scottish Town Centre Improvement Plans? Is this part of the toolkit uh, to set the starting benchmark and where priorities for improvement can be aimed? So. Audrey, I'm going to start with you on that one from the point of view of the um, of the toolkit um, and whether that fits into there. And then maybe Jamie, do you want to pick up on some ideas about measurement of success? Because we absolutely have to evaluate as we go, otherwise there's no point in doing it. Um, Audrey. Thank you. Yeah, it is a really good point, Ian. Um, and just if I start, if I come back to the toolkit in a little second, but if we start on the, the place investment programme that Phil mentioned, this is a, a new project or a, a new way of working um, for the Scottish Government that has literally just came out and it was actually put to them by the Town Centre Review Group um, on the Town Centre Action Plan. And um, as Phil had said, we're just waiting on that guidance coming out. But basically the way that they're looking at at it going forward is that are looking at that long, longer term capital funding coming out um, through um, place investment programme which will come out through place plans um, so as soon as we um, get the guidance from Scottish Government we will be working on that and, and working out how, how best and all the monitoring and evaluation will obviously be, be added into that so hopefully that helps you at this stage. Um, regarding the, the toolkit, the toolkit is really just um, the aim of it is really just to inspire communities and and I think maybe one thing that we're not so good at in the Shire is that cross and um, collaboration and cross advertising from one town to another so it was really just um, highlighting all a variety of projects and, and we've missed that there's a load that we've missed out 
but it's to give a little sense of different types of projects that different groups have been working on and, and try to connect different groups from one end of the shire to the other with some of the tools and tips that are actually available from national agencies or, or funding tips, etc. So really the toolkit is there and it's a working document so we can keep adding to it and we've got our town web page as well where we've got up to date current information on, on funding, etc. Um, but really that was where it came from, was just to inspire and to to share that best practice throughout throughout the Shire. Thank you. Uh, Jamie, do you want to add to that? Yes, um, in terms of like measurement um, outputs and KPIs and the like, when the My Pets Mentoring Programme was funded, uh, as part of part of that funding package was an element that we measure the outputs over the three years. And so how this works is basically like when new groups come on board, they will, they will fill in a, a bit of paperwork for us, as Carla will know about intake surveys and where the skill sets of the group currently are, what's missing, what's strong, what's not, etc. Um, and as we're now just, and we work with an independent uh, external consultant to do, to do a kind of review of the programme. So it's not diluted by internal flavours at all. And that's currently, um, happening at the moment, March of this year, in terms of uh, we're now looking at groups that are coming off the mentoring programme who've been here for the first kind of run or half of that, so we've taken them off. So we're now going to interview those, um, again, not done by me, done independently. So we'll interview groups, we'll get um, kind of measured feedback from them, how they found, how they found the My Place mentoring programme, has it helped, has it not helped, what kind of resources were missing, uh, what did you like about it, what did you not like about it. And then this is this is data that we can then share with our kind of peers in the in the sector, the likes of DTAS, the likes of uh, the Architecture Heritage Fund, the likes of um, the National Lottery Heritage Fund, that kind of thing. So we will know we've got tangible evidence of yes, this program is working. But there's also that wonderful intangible element too. Um, you know, the, the level of pride that people feel when the town gets uplifted, the level of pride people feel when they see um, a Derrick building coming back to life. Um, the fact that community are feel part of that process is, is really, really important. It's hard to measure, but then again, I think some of it falls outside needing to be measured in my in my regard. I think it's just that kind of feel good factor. People saying well done, people like I don't know, picking up a leaflet or getting excited about number 30 or like when I go up to a group um, up, in, up in Yellow Sky, for example, and they're just thankful that I've made that trip all the way from Glasgow uh, to get there to help them with their project. So there's an awful lot of that kind of anecdotal evidence, which which doesn't get kind of read, relayed back. But we do have all that. We've got all the numbers, we've got all the graphs and everything. So we know then that when we go back to our funders, we can say, yes, this has made a positive difference based on A, B, C and D and et cetera. So it's, it's really, really good and it's super important. That's great. Thanks, Jamie. Um, I've been saying we're finishing at 4.30, actually we should have finished at four o'clock, so um, my skillful chairing, which is, I told you I'll get in the model, um, but it's been absolutely fascinating, but we have overrun a little bit, so um, I think we'll call it a day there, um, and thank you for that. Um, I will very, very quickly just um, thank um, everybody, and then and then that'll be us. Um, and, and really, many, many thanks to our speakers. Um, to Phil, who, who had to go shooting off to talk to the Irish Assembly, uh, Northern Irish, uh, uh, Irish Assembly, I should say. Uh, to Carolyn, thank you so much for coming all the way from Huntley um, to talk to us. And Rachel, all the way from Banff. Um, it's tremendous. Um, and Jamie, thank you to you um, from the, to, to uh, help, I've forgotten. Anyway, thank you to you uh, for the Scottish uh, Civic Trust. There, I got there. Perfect. Um, thank you very much. And, and you know, I, I'm sure there will be people coming to see you, Jamie, as a result of this today. Um, we had at the height of the meet of the call, we had 108 people. Um, despite the fact we overrun, we have still got over half of them with us. So that I think indicates um, what a tremendous session it's been. Um, so thank you all very much. And Anne, thank you for your summing up um, of the speakers as well. That was that was really great. And, and for your time this afternoon because I know you're, you're very busy. Um, but most of all, on behalf of everybody, um, Audrey, thank you to you and to the team. You've done a fantastic job bringing this together this afternoon. You really have. You're an absolute star. Um, and the work that you do with our towns and, and communities across Aberdeenshire is, is absolutely first rate. 
Um, and it's just been a fantastic afternoon. I've enjoyed it. I hope you all have. Um, and let's do it again. Audrey, are you doing anything next week? Shall we try it again? <laughs> a joke. Thank you all very much indeed, though, and um, a very good afternoon to you all. Thank you. Thank you.